Well, of course, war had been declared, and uh, we, I was in the Girl Guides at the time, and we were all anxious to do our bit. And then a chap came from the Civic Centre to our guide uh, meeting and said he wanted volunteers so that they would be messengers. And then he said, have you all got bicycles? We all had bicycles. And um, we, uh, well, we volunteered, but um, they only passed two of us in Skeddy Hall, and then they said that we were going to be trained. So uh, now we were immaculate, you know, naturally. We were, our socks were white and everything was wonderful. And then we were sent in to huts that were set on fire, and we had to crawl along to sort of, that it wouldn't frighten us eventually if it had to happen. But of course they'd been set on fire a lot before and there was a lot of sort of black gooey stuff around, you know, which of course went on all our clothes and when we touched our faces like this, which way to go, it was all on our faces. But we got out anyway and um, we were taught then after that, we were taught how to make bombs, Molotov cocktails to start with, and afterwards, we were told what was in bombs, you know. And um, I've forgotten most of it, but I know some of it was diesel and or some fluid like that and uh, the stuff that they put on the land, you know. And uh, anyway, that's all I can remember. And as I was being told, it's just as well for you to forget. Because all the children asked me in the schools, how would you make a bomb? <laughs> but anyway, we were taught how to make Molotov cocktails and we were taught how to jump from first story windows onto a tank, was a mock-up of a tank, and we had to open it up, light our Molotov cocktail, put it in, and put the lid down and jump off. Now it sounded so easy. What the Germans would have been doing at the time, I do not know, I dare not think about it. But, um, and then one girl said, I'm not allowed to have matches, so the <laughs> anyway, that sort of thing happened, you know. And anyway, I passed and I went to a Pier Street to our, they'd taken over a house there, and that was our post. And that was our post then for the next four years. And um, I, I went down there the other day and it's gone. I think they could have kept it, you know, as a, a reminder, because all our equipment was in there, but they don't, do they? But um, anyway, we had lots of experiences and uh, we soon got to know how long it would take when the amber warning came through we soon got to know we had to be out then because the red warning was only came through when they were nearly overhead because you think now they came from France and um, they only had to cross the English Channel and they didn't get uh, seen until Devon well then it was only the Bristol Channel and us so we, we, we had minutes sometimes warning but more often than not, as we were running from the post up towards the shelters at the Wine Street and that, the, we could hear them overhead. They had a very peculiar noise, like, mmm, mmm, mmm. Now, different from the RAF planes, we could tell the difference, you know. And uh, we settled down. We didn't stay much in the shelters because we were needed outside, and that's where we were. But sometimes I had to go in and... Um, give the bad news that uh, a place had uh, gone, you know, or something like that. One day I had to go in and I had to walk through and they were all tensed and looking up. I stopped in front of my mother and I remember she took a deep breath. I said, it's all right, Dad's all right. He's digging somebody out in Fisher Street. But I said, I'm afraid our house has had a hit and we can't go back. And uh, she said, was anybody hurt? I said, no, we'll cope then, she said. But they were wonderful, wonderful people. They were so brave. I'll always remember the people of Swansea as very brave, such courage, patience, and the camaraderie was wonderful. I see it now and again when it snows. There they are, everybody helping one another. It's lovely. Those people, they're still there. They Well, of course, they're children now, and but they're still very lovely people. But anyway... Um, I remember this, this, we didn't have a lot of casualties until the worst casualties were the Blitz, you know. And uh, I remember the chap, we were at the bottom of one street, we all had our allocated places where we had to go. And I was running up now to get to my place and the, the man, the 
caretaker of Lloyds Bank stopped me and said, can you come up and help me? Uh, he had a flat roof and a sort of bungalow on top. It lovely it was there. So we rushed up and there were a load of fire bombs or incendiaries, you know. So we swept them off the roof because there was nobody in the road anyway. And um, we heard a whistle blowing. Now when a whistle blowed, we, blows, we knew we had to go. It was needed. So anyway, because I was the only girl in six wardens and I was young, I was told to go everywhere, and even the, the, the young man I was with said, you better go down, and uh, so I ran down the steps, round the corner in Wine Street, and I could see Mr Scott, our head warden, leaning over a body on the ground. So I ran up, and as I ran up, he said, take your lanyard off. So I took my lanyard off, my precious girl guide lanyard. He said, put it on his leg. Now it was black, it was. It was you know, there were no lights, and the stars weren't out, and the moon wasn't out because it wasn't a very nice night. So everything was black. The only light we had was where the guns would flash, you know. And um, I was like this, what, what do I do then? He said, put a tourniquet, put that on the bottom of his knee. And I went, where's his knee? Where's the rest? It's over there, he said. Right. Well, um, I said, oh, no, I just passed my first aid and I was very full of myself I said oh Mr Scott I said you have to put it up on the main artery at the top of the leg he said you can't go up there now all hell was going on he said to me you're a young girl this is a full-grown man you can't go messing about up there so he said and then he lost it the first time I, he said put the bloody tourniquet on he said right I, I put it on his knee uh, yeah and he put it at one up here. And we, then I said, we had to let go every three minutes or the limb will die. Oh, he's there then with his watch, you know, the luminous. Right, we can leave it go. Now it's a bitter cold night and I knew when he was bleeding because my hands got warm, you know. So anyway, um, we, in the meantime, another warden had dashed to the post to get the medics, you know, uh, an ambulance. There were no ambulances, really, though they were vans, they were, with a bit of linoleum down the back. And one drew up at last, after about three quarters of an hour, and um, he said, uh, he looked at him, he looked at what we'd done, he said, this is good. He said, he's going to live mine, you're going to be all right, you've saved his life. That was a good moment, you know and uh, they took him away. But as he, they were just leaving, Mr. Scott said, hang on, and he picked up the half a leg with a boot on and threw it into the back of the, of the van, the ambulance. And of course the blood went like that. And he said he heard a clunk and he turned around and I was flat out. It was the first time and last time I fainted. But I was covered, absolutely. He said, don't go into the shelter, it's like that. Go back to the post and we'll wash it off. He said, because we frighten them if we go in now. But, uh, you know, we came through that day, but it was a very bad three days. Now, on the last night, we went up to the top of Wine Street. Now, I had to go with them because, as now, we know, know the police, if you're going to deal with women, you've got to have a woman with you. So, I was there, I was there, all... 19 years of me, you know, it was 17 then, it was 17 years, and um, we were standing there, there, because this is the morning after, can you imagine what it was like the night before? Well, anyway, we could see Care Street, that David uh, Ben Evans was going to fall into it, and um, we were screaming at the people to go back, and we picked them up, we said, at the church, St Mary's. So we ran back down and along the little St Mary Street and as we came round the corner, St Mary's was on fire. There was even flames coming through the top of the tower. And we ran on past, there's nothing we could do, we ran on past and we picked up 20 people and we took them back with us. And as we were coming back past, we could hear the bells going down. It, was, it had burned through by this time, you see the wooden uh, holders of them and I remember what you've got to remember about my age I was 19 but we were 14 year olds in what they are today mind and I turned to Mr Scott and I said the Germans are going to lose the war now Mr Scott he said how do you reckon I said well 
they've burnt God's house, and he's not going to have that. And I was so full of myself that he'd burnt God's house and God wasn't going to have it, you see. And they teased me about it a lot after, but uh, that's the way I felt about it. And, you know, I went to give them a talk in St Mary's uh, a year or so ago, and it is in the night, and um, I'd walk through the top of the church. I knew exactly where I was because they'd been built back exactly the same. And I came out of where we used to have our guides, and uh, the vicar was with me and somebody else. And as we slowly walked through the church, they had one little light on, and that was shining on this beautiful silver cross they have on the altar. And I looked at the church, and it was re receding into the gloom with the arches there, you know. And I said, I could feel it. I said, St. Mary's is back. And that was only a couple of years ago. But it's, do you know St. Mary's was there when in Celtic times? And this is the fourth St. Mary's. And this is a copy of the last one. This one is. So you think it must be a very special place, you know, that even the Celts uh, had a place there. St. Thomas always had a problem because it was next to the docks. And, of course, I mean, they knew that a lot of dockers lived there as well, wonderful people. They tried then to shoot the balloons down, but they were thick, thick plastic, which meant that uh, they didn't come down, you see. Sometimes it wouldn't be till the next day. But um, they gave up after a bit of shooting the balloons down, and then they turned on St. Thomas, and... Uh, they hoping they were they hopefully thought that they were going to hit the docks but they didn't they hit st thomas instead they, where the people were living and uh, then they 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 bombed a whole terrace in town hill and uh, that was i think because they were aiming for either st thomas or the docks and then on the very last night the third night because they couldn't i think we think anyway they turned on the town because they were going to get something done, you know, and they burned the whole town out. Well, when we got to the top of Wine Street, because we were, you know, just before we sort of got the people to go back down Kerr Street, I thought the world was on fire because it was burning. It burned from Castle Street to the YMCA, right across. Nothing could have lived in there. Um, the firemen couldn't do anything because the bombs had blown up the, the water uh, and all the pipes. So they put a pipe down through a little opening by Swansea Castle, straight down to where there was a dock at the, on the off, just off the strand. But the dock was full of debris, and of course nothing was coming through. And I was seeing firemen in tears with frustration. And don't forget, they'd been going for three days and three nights, and like us, they were exhausted. And uh, there was nothing they could do. They were just standing there. There was nothing they could do. And every, you, th you think about it, all the gas mains, and there was a lot of people on gas in those days, they were all burning in the centre. So we were yelling at a couple of people, or there were 20 of them actually, to get, get back and go round to the church. And then we picked them up there. But um, it was... They were determined to wreck our town because they couldn't wreck the docks. They probably thought they'd have put the town out of action, but they didn't. And uh, that's what happened there. But when we were up at the top there now and seeing that everything was all right and we got the people out, the head warden said to us, um, we'd better go down and see how things are at the bottom. And he said to me and the other warden, you run down and see how things are. Well, when we got down, there was another warden down there who said, we got to do something. The, uh, we were next to a brewery, you see, our um, post, our, well, it was a shelter, it was. Now, you know the Salubrian Hotel is there now, Salubrian Hotel is there. Exactly where the hall is, that was where our post was, exactly. I said, what a come down for a lovely poster. Anyway, um, and he said, the top, of the fire watchers have said, the top of the Hancock's Brewery is burning on fire. We had to run back up now to tell what were we going to do, because we couldn't do anything without the head warden, you see, and uh, it's it, very protocol, you know. Anyway, he, down he came, he said, well, the brewery is full of alcohol. Now, that is a bomb. Now, he said, we've got to take the people out. 
Now there were 132 people, I've still got the number, in the, po in the shelter. And he said, we can't go down towards the Towie River. HMS Lucy was there and it's got their hands full. There are no shelters. We can't go to the South Dock. There are no shelters. The town is burning the other way. The only way we can go is to St Thomas because there's a big shelter there at the entrance to the docks, big enough to take us all. Well, they went in to tell the people that they had to move. Now, all hell was going on, and we were having to tell these people they had to get out. So we divided them up into three. They were all crying. Some didn't want to go, till my father, who was in the First World War, knew how to deal. He said, if you stay here, you might die, but you've got a chance to live if you come with us. So they did. The young ones who could run, they were the first wave. They went over with two wardens. Now we had to go along Key Parade, past the flour mills, and across another bridge then. So anyway, the second lot of go the, were the middle-aged and, uh, you know, that those could go along quietly and nicely. They went. And then he turned to me and another young warden, and he said, uh, the young ward, and I said he was about 35, but he had something wrong with his leg. I say he was young. Anyway, he said, you'll have to bring up the old people, you two will. And he turned to me, he said, now you know you like old people. I didn't know I liked them until that day, but I was told I did. And he said, you bring them along as you can. Now, most of the ladies there were Roman Catholics, and lovely, lovely people. But they wanted to say their prayers in the middle of the road. Now, there was army vehicles, there was ambulances, there was fires. So we had to punch them to get them off their knees onto the... I never, I've never punched anyone since. But anyway, to get them onto the pavement, and um, they were very huffy about it, and they said they were going to tell my mother about me, because they knew me, you see. So I had a worry now. I had the worry, the bombs, nothing, but to tell my mother about me. And my mum never put a hand on me, but I, I didn't cross her, you know. She was a lovely mum. And uh, we got them going. Anyway, we had to push them and prod them. And, Come on, you know, to get them, because they wanted to rest. You can't rest. Never mind. Mind, I think to myself now with my legs, if somebody said to me that, I said, well, you go on without me then. But anyway, um, we got them all into the shelters. A huge, at the entrance of the dock was this big shelter. And um, they didn't tell my mother about me. I was so pleased. But anyway, he called us all out again. He said, we've got to go back. Well, we knew we had to because we had to help, you see. And I turned to say goodbye to my mother. And my father said, don't. She'll try and keep you in. Don't. Just vanish. So we did. And we ran back across the bridges, you know. And uh, anybody we saw, we helped. And that's the way we carried on that night. But um, what was so frightening was the bells were ringing. Now, that was a sign of invasion, and that's at the back of all our minds was invasion. And we did know that in the places like France, I can see him now, he went France, Belgium, Holland, and all the countries that they invaded, they shot the people who were in uniform. So we said, the first thing we've got to do is take our uniforms off if, we'll, if they come down. Well, I... I thought, well, how can I take my uniform off? I'll be in my petticoat. I can't do that, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I was very young. Um, we ran back to the post, and I remember he picked up the telephone, and he said, thank you, God, he said, just like that. He said, it's all right. It's not invasion. The heat is making the bells ring. So, oh, I thought, marvellous. We rushed back. Nothing could bother us. We didn't mind the bombs, but we didn't want them to come in on parachutes. But something terrible happened that night, and I haven't talked about it, but lately I will talk about it. It didn't happen, but it could have. But the head of the ARP had come to see us because we were always in trouble, you know, because we were aiming for the docks and hit us. And um, he said, um, Mr. Scott, uh, Scott, he said, Scotty, he said, what would you do if a young Nazi thug came down on a parachute and landed at your feet? Now, Scotty was a good, kind man, a good Christian, you know. He said, I'd pick a, a brick up and I'd smash his head in. Now, we had been driven that night. We'd seen, we'd seen dead babies. I'd been let down on a rope to a cellar 
I thought they were all asleep. Came because I was the littlest. I was let down, you know. I came up. They're all right. They're all asleep. They sent me back to the post because what I didn't realise is they were all dead. Not a mark on them, but the blast that killed them, you know. Now we'd seen all that, and we were up here. That's why I can sympathise with our army people when they get driven. There's only so far you can drive a person. And he turned to me and he said, Miss Griffiths, what did you, we're very polite, even in an air, air, air raid, what did you have been doing while he was doing that? And I have said, God forgive me ever since, I'd have been helping him. Now that's how far you can be driven. But um, the day before, I'd heard that there'd been a direct hit on the streets in St. Thomas, and my father said, go over and see if the family are all right. We had some cousins there. He said, it's a little bit too near where they live. So run over. So I went over, and I, uh, I ran. I was running everywhere then. And when I got to um, the road, and I looked up, the house had gone. But a neighbor about four doors down came down, and she, she put her arm on me. She says, hello, Elaine. She said, they're quite safe now. They're all right now. They're over in the church. Oh, good, I thought. Right. I'll come with you, she said. So she came over with me to the church. And when we got in, as early, it was about midday, but as early as it was, there were my cousins in two coffins, mummy and daddy, and in a little coffin that size, square, white, were my two baby cousins. And the little baby was only about five weeks old. She was lying on her back, and her brother was about 15 months. They turned him towards her, put his arm around her. That finished me. Well, I, I'd seen all that, and as I say, when you, you see that, you can't go over the top, you know. But uh, what a waste that was. Killed all lovely people, a whole crescent of, of in Town Hill, all those lovely people which would have grown up and been useful to us now. But they're all gone. My cousins were two chemists for the ICI, so their children would have been educated and grown up, you know. I remember one night, I think it was the second night of the Blitz. It was such an horrendous time that you can get a bit muddled, you know. But um, we knew where people were. I must explain this. They, I had to go around with a long list, you know, of whether they'd be in their cellars, or whether they'd be in this shelter, the, the main shelter. And um, there'd been a bomb dropped on a house, and I knew by my lists that I had, they were in their shelter, in their cellar. So um, we had to get the rescue squad along, and uh, they put down, they couldn't hear anything, or, so there was, a, it's through the ruins, you could see the steps, so they said, if they tied, who's the smallest here? Well, of course, the eye was the smallest. They put a rope around my waist, and I had to go down the stairs, the steps, till I pushed some of the debris aside so I could look into the cellar. And um, I did. It was very quiet. And I looked in, and I, I managed, with the aid of my little torch, to, to run it along where they were. And they were all fast asleep. So I came back up, and I said, they're all right, they're all asleep. And um, they're all right, though. And um, the head warden looked at my father, and my father said, go back to the post and see if there's any messages for us, and put the kettle on and take your time. So I did. And we were always used to doing what we were told in those days, you know. But anyway, I went back, I did everything, and then I thought, well, I've done everything. I better go back and tell them, you know, the kettle's boiled. I went back, and they were just bringing them out. They brought out the mother and the grandmother. And I said, they're still asleep. And then I thought, no. So in those days, you touch their wrist, the pulse was. Today, they're up here. But anyway, there was no pulse. They were all dead. Not a mark on them. The blast had killed them. And uh, my father, he was used to seeing such terrible things in the First World War. He said, when they didn't have a mark on them, he said, it'll be better because that's how they'll be remembered. He said, by the people who have to identify them. 
and uh, it was a very bad time, you know, when you think about it, wasn't it? I can hardly believe it now. I remember when the Americans first came into the war and gradually they got over here to this country because they weren't really in the war till middle of 1942, you know. And um, they were stationed up in Morriston and the two had found their way down to the bottom of Wine Street. And the air raid sirens came on and they were all in the shelters. And um, I remember a little tale that was told to me afterwards about them. They were, they were very quiet in the shelters, not the usual, you know. And it was only a few bombs dropping, nothing much. But anyway, um, I remember a police sergeant in Morriston telling my dad that they were very badly behaved in Morriston, you know, and uh, they, w they really thought they were the, the boys, you know. But after they had so many fights, the sergeant, he came, he came into the one day and he was looking a bit white. So the other policeman said, what's the matter? He said, you won't believe what happened to me yesterday. He said, one of the... Took his revolver out, he said, and I froze. And he said, he put it on my desk and said to me, if any of my boys do anything wrong, shoot them. And he said, I'm still shaking. <laughs> so we, we, we really didn't take them seriously after that, you know. <laughs> but uh, most of our raids was over then. But uh, the few I did see were very, very t quiet in the shelters. They, were, they weren't there. And I, I said, oh, this is nothing. I said, you want to have been in an air raid, you know. But there we are. The town shopping centre was completely wiped out, including the market. I mean, the market was the centre of our town, you know. And shops were rendered useless by, well, they had either bombs in them or they had bombs that hadn't blown up, but they were still dangerous, you know. There were, there were 171 food shops gone, 64 grocer shops, 61 butchers, 12 bakeries, 34 hotels, and of course, there's the restaurants and the cafes, they'd all gone. And the figure that does, it does not deal with the greengrocers and other stalls in the lost market. But to illustrate to you from the market's point of view, there were 45 butchers' holdings in the market, and these 45 butchers were supplying no less than 22,000 people. So it was an horrendous morning, that next morning, when we looked at our town, which was burning, it burned for days, actually. Well, of course, what was worse of all for us were the casualties of people, you know. There were 230 people killed and 409 people injured. The nurses in the hospital were wonderful. The hospitals were overflowing, and many people were treated in the large corridors that were the old Swansea General Hospital. There were 12 more attacks in 1941 alone. These attacks resulted in 387 people killed and 851 injured. So much of Swansea was damaged and all the lovely late Victorian and Edwardian buildings seem to have gone now. Tylo Crescent was pretty well wiped out during the war because they were aiming for a target and obviously missed it. And the whole crescent was pretty well obliterated. A lot of people killed there. And I remember a man telling me that his two sons had been killed at the side of him. He was bewildered because why he was alive and not them. And he laid them out on the grass in front of the house because the people next door were underneath their kitchen and they were alive and he had to go and help them. And when he came back, his sons had gone. But the ambulances had been coming along and picking up the dead and the wounded in the same ambulance and taking them to Swansea Gen, where the nurses, they must have been wonderful people, they sorted them out. And um, it's a very small world, you know, because the brother, the remaining brother of those two boys who were killed, he married a lady and she worked in our shop for, oh, 30 or 40 years. And we're still friendly with her, of course. 
but it's such a small world. But they, what they didn't know was, and what ought to be really, you know, told to the people of Swansea, was that there's a wonderful, wonderful book in St. Mary's Church, and um, it, it really is very beautiful. It's like as if the monks have written it and put pictures in it. And they've got the name of every casualty that died during the Second World War. And uh, all you have to do is ring the vicar, and he will make arrangements for you, anyone to see it. But when I found out about it and I told them, they said, what a beautiful book it was. The other was 15. And I thought, what a waste.